Today we want to see, study the fall of man. Now we all know that the world is a really beautiful world. Evidence of beauty is around us, and yet it's been messed up. If you really want to see the world in its original condition, if that's possible, you need to almost be a deep sea diver, go to the deepest ocean where men have not been yet to mess it up, where pollution has not dirtied it, and you will see amazing God's creation. People travel all the world to see mountains, but they're deforested, to go to beautiful beaches, but they're polluted. So really we can sense the world was beautiful, but it has something has gone wrong and things are getting worse. So what are we going to blame? Who are we going to blame? Most people will blame things around us. They say, you know, why so much immorality? Women. <laughs> Internet. That's what makes us corrupt. Why so much uh, cheating and corruption in government? Too much money. They're printing too much money. So we blame things. But the Bible tells us the real problem is not the things around us, the real problem is us. So the question is, how did God's man, God created, become like us? It begins, the book in Genesis chapter 3, begins with a very strange creature called the serpent. Now, when you think of serpent, you think of snakes slithering on the ground. But later we'll find out this serpent actually was a reptile. In the creation story in Genesis 1, it tells us God made three types of animals. The beast, that's the wild ones. The cattle, that's the domesticated animals. And the creeping thing or the crawling thing. That's a reptile. So this serpent in Genesis chapter 3, verse 1, is really a reptile. And this reptile can speak. So likely... It is possessed by Satan. What do we learn? What's the first seed truth we learn here? Satan exists. And Satan doesn't want you to know he exists. He likes to do things behind the scenes. He likes to work through agents so that his real, awful, threatening presence is not known to men. So what happens is, Satan used a serpent. He possessed a serpent. And you know, in our time, we think of a serpent, it's a snake, kind of scary. But in the time of the Garden of Eden, every animal was a friend of Adam and of Eve. So the serpent is like a pet dog coming, you know, it's like the serpent coming along and talking to Eve. And Eve, of course, doesn't know that serpents cannot talk. So she listens to this serpent as if it's a friend giving her advice. <clears throat> so here we see a very important truth that we must all know. We must know that the devil, Satan, disguises himself as an angel of light. That's his method of working. That's found in Second. Corinthians eleven fourteen. So what does Satan do nowadays? He doesn't use serpents because we know a serpent cannot talk. Well, he can use your friend to suggest things to you. He could use your favorite program to pollute you. He could use your favorite elite school that you go to to corrupt you. He could use any of these agents. So it's very, very important that we understand the first tactic of Satan. And most people in the world say, there's no such thing as the devil. It's just a figment. It's a cartoon figure, you know. He has succeeded. And even most Christians, they walk around as if Satan is like some faraway place in some evil temple somewhere or some evil uh, place somewhere and they don't realize that Satan walks around through the earth seeking whom he may deceive. All right, so I hope today you understand even where you're sitting right now, surrounded by things you like, any of those could be an agent that Satan will use to pollute your mind.
Let's continue our study in the fall of man by seeing three more seed truths. We see how Satan likes to defame God. He comes to the woman and says, Is it true that you can't eat of every tree in the garden? Actually, God just told them, avoid two trees out of the possibly millions of trees, beautiful trees. This is Satan's common tactic. You hear people whom Satan will use saying, you Christians can't do everything. Oh, really? Well, for one, I can't commit adultery. I know that will mess up my marriage. Another, I don't want to get into addiction because I, whether it's uh, alcohol or pornography, I know that will ruin me. You know, there are some things that God does restrict us, but they are not. We can still enjoy, the, like the millions of other trees in the garden, we can have wonderful lives. I can say this for myself. I, couldn't, I wouldn't want to change my life for any other. I enjoy every day of my life and I'm filled with joy. So why does Satan do this, right? He wants us to be dissatisfied with God. Very, very common tactic that he uses. So you'll hear people coming to you all the time and say, I feel so sorry for you Christians. Everything you can't do. And then, you know, if you're gullible and foolish, you will probably swallow that and say, yeah, I'm really deprived of a lot of things. God is kind of unfair to me, right? So be careful of this. So there's a second See truth. The third see truth in this in this uh, chapter is why did the serpent approach Eve, not Adam? Now, generally speaking, don't take this as something a bias or a sexist remark. Women are more gullible. When they see someone friendly, like this serpent came, like a friendly person, emotionally they are already somewhat gullible, they are emotionally vulnerable. And so while men tend to be more objective, they will size up the person, you flatter me, you know, flattery works a lot on women. That's right. Men who want to take advantage of women always use this very simple tactic. In fact, flattery, uh, you find all these people who take advantage of women. They're not the best looking, they're not the smartest, but they master the art of flattering, looking very kind and friendly and flatter that person. So he came up to Eve, knowing Eve is more gullible. Yeah, am I making my own comments? Actually, in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 6, it tells us in the last days, Many evil men will lead away many gullible women, right? In King James used the word silly women, easily fooled. But in the correct word is gullible. And so, you know, you find if people want to sell something, whether it's a, a gimmick, or, they usually go to the wife. And usually find in cults, for example, the, the leader is usually a man, but his die-hard followers, who literally will die with him, the vast majority, are ladies. Okay, so that's another thing. So ladies, be a little careful of someone coming like a friend, very flatters you, just beware. Third, seat, uh, fourth seat truth, it says <clears throat> how Eve tried to defend herself. The devil said, you can't eat of every tree. And he said, no, we can eat of every tree except that tree, those trees. We're not supposed to eat nor touch them. Well, where did she add that from? God never said you can't touch. So why did she add this? You see, when we try to defend a truth, we tend to over 
exaggerate. We want to have more defense. And this thing have more defense by stating more additional to what God said. It's very common. You find, for example, some churches will teach you that you cannot touch alcohol. Oh, really? When the Bible does it say you cannot touch alcohol? That's a new one. I haven't read, I've read the Bible umpteen times. I never saw that. Jesus' first miracle, he turned water to wine. And was it for, for drinking, of course? It wasn't for, for, for pouring in the toilet. <clears throat> now, why do people say that? They want to make their position stronger. So they add to the word of God. Now, if you cannot touch alcohol, a lot of medicines you can't take, all your, most of your mixtures, uh, cough mixtures, even a baby, you give baby, you know, when they got a lot of gas, when I was a little kid, my mom used to give me gripe water, and a lot of alcohol in it, you know. A lot of things are dissolved in alcohol, and if a lot of medicines are made with alcohol. Now, you can't touch it when your doctor wants to swap you. He has to use alcohol to inject you. You have to touch alcohol. And when you're dying, terminal uh, cancer, they give you a cocktail before you die to so help you bear the agony and the suffering. And it contains alcohol, even morphine in it, morphia. All right? So, but of course, you don't get addicted. You're going to die. And what do you worry about addiction? You know, the Bible says, don't drink till you get drunk. Don't let alcohol control you. Never says don't touch. So we have these kind of churches that like to add just like Eve. And we then people start to mock it. And they say, this is ridiculous, right? So be careful. Defend God with God's word. Don't add or subtract. Subtracting looks bad. Adding is just as bad. So these are three little truths we can see in Genesis chapter 3. Let's go on and study three more seed truths in Genesis chapter 3. The fifth truth is Satan will put doubts in our mind. The serpent said to Eve, you won't die. Surely you won't die. You know, this is just sowing that doubt. She was clear. She said, if we eat it, we will die. No, don't believe that. Are you sure? Right? So this is what often we, often we have this kind of doubts thrown at us. Starting in Genesis 1, these doubts were thrown at Bible scholars. Are you sure God can make this amazing world in just six days? Are you sure? Are you sure there are literal days? You know, all throughout church history, people believe there were literal days. Why? Because God put a stamp at the end of every day and said, evening and morning were the first day. Evening and morning were the second day. Now, that stamp is saying, this is a literal, normal day. Not an era, not a period, right? Not a zillion years. It has an evening and a morning. No e million years or 10 years or five years is an evening and morning, which is the evening, which is the morning. But doubts are like that put in and then all of a sudden people say, oh, I, I, I wonder whether God really meant a literal day. Right? So we have all kinds of questions thrown at us to make us believe, wonder whether a verse, you know, we'll say, are you sure this verse actually means that? Now, for years we read it and it's like clear as daylight, you know, it's like obvious, you don't need a PhD for that. But often when the doubt is sown, then we start to look for some reason why that verse uh, cannot be so. <clears throat> so be careful huh, when doubts Ah, so that's the fifth seed truth. Let's look at the sixth one. Satan said, you know what? Frankly, if you eat it, your eyes, you will be like God's and your eyes will be opened. <laughs> the irony of it was, if Eve was not so easily flattered, 
Okay, so that statement, you'll be like gods, is really a very flattering statement. But he could easily have answered, we are made in the image of God, in his likeness. What do you mean we'll be like gods? Excuse me, you know, if it was Adam, there was a possibility he would say, what? I heard we were made in the image of God. But if maybe being flattered, maybe he saw this pleasant creature, friendly, seems very reasonable, talking to her, and she bought that. And he said, then you will know, your eyes will be open, and you will know good and evil. You see, God had made us man in his image, except for the fact that he makes the rules. <laughs> okay, cannot obviously every man can make rules, then there will be no rules, right? So we are made in his image in many ways, except we're not allowed to make rules. We can't create, we can't make rules, right? Because we are tenants on his land. The landlord makes the rules, so one of his rules is don't eat the fruit. Fair enough, you go to a hotel, you're told you can make all the noise you like, by the 11 o'clock, please keep quiet, and you keep quiet. If not, hotel management will expel you from the hotel, and later Adam and Eve were expelled from the Garden of Eden. Makes sense, right? Now, he said, your eyes will be open and you know good from evil. You see, God knew that he had to make the rules okay, because he didn't put in man that capacity to know clearly what is good and what is evil. So he had to make the rules. That wasn't part of our creative DNA. Now, even up to today, we make pretty bad rules, you know. All the laws we make have loopholes and all kinds of problems, and we make rules that are not good for us, okay? So, we, she was tempted, you know, wow, I'm like God, and I can make my own rules. Isn't that nice? Okay, I can even be more than what I am. Yeah, all of us like to make our own rules. Who doesn't? Right? Because that's our ego saying, I'm smart enough. I know what I'm doing. Even a child will tell his parents, don't tell me what to do. I know, mom. I'm not stupid. Right? So even a child thinks he knows enough. Okay? So he decided. So that's another seed truth that we will have to look at that the flattery worked and Eve loves to make her own rules, and so do we. Seventh seed truth is that in Genesis chapter 3, verse 6, the woman looked at the fruit and said, Wow, looks delicious. He looks at the shape of the fruit and says, Wow, it was pleasant to her eyes. Not only delicious, but beautiful. We don't like fruits that are not only nice tasting, but nice, like a juicy plum or a peach, a pinky color. Whoa, you know, like food has to not only look taste good, it has to look beautiful too. And more than that, you said, wow, if I eat of this, I will be wise like God. Aha. So three things. We are told in first John chapter 2, verse 16, the lust of the eyes, be careful of this, the lust of the eyes, no, sorry, the lust for food, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. All right, so be careful, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Let's look at these three common sins. Lust of the flesh. We, if we give ourselves the luxury to make our own rules, we'll sleep all day. We don't even want to get up. <laughs> Just hang around, lie down. We'll eat all we want to eat. And then we have sex. You know, the, 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 the ultimate of the man of the flesh. Just sleep, eat, and have sex. <clears throat> now, all these are not wrong. These are God-given enjoying food. That's God-given. Rest is God-given. Sex within the bounds of marriage is God-given. Nothing wrong, but God teaches us the rules for all these things. 
gluttony, be careful, right? So, so we have people who, for example, the lust of the eyes, some people are just always going to the newest site, have to go to the newest mountain, have to go to the strangest country just to see something, you know, just have to see. After they see that, they have to see something else. And then when they're home, they have to look at Instagram of every every interesting thing, you know, the lust of the eye cannot be satisfied. The eye are two little balls, but you cannot really satisfy them. You know, the stomach, you after a while, you get full, right? The lust of the eye, very hard to fill, you know, you can just keep... Uh, 20, uh, 24-7, you can see new images on your Instagram, you know, and, and of course, the pride of life, you know, the ego that, that man has. Now, ambition is not wrong. To want to be good is not wrong. But if God made us to be number 100 in the world, don't be happy that you can be number 100. That, that's your ambition. Be what you want to be. Be the best you can be. You don't then have to cheat, and sabotage people to be, instead of number 100, number 1 or number 50, <clears throat> okay? So, be careful of the lust of the flesh. Gluttonies, now modern sin, you know? When you see cook shows become number one shows, you know we are already in trouble. Eating and eating and thinking of newer and better and crazier food, right? Then, the lust of the eyes. Endless sights cannot satisfy. And then finally, the pride of life. Everything you want to be number one at any cost. Family is broken, everything. I need to be number one. Otherwise, my ego cannot handle that. So be careful of this. I hope these seed truths will help you. Seven seed truths that we've already seen. We continue now learning some important truths that will help us overcome sin. First question we like to ask ourselves here is why was Eve standing next to this forbidden tree? I mean, there's so many beautiful sights and trees and fruits to eat in the garden. All hers. Everyone. Why did she hang around that tree? First principle, important principle is don't hang around in a place where you're not supposed to be. Satan will get you. He walks around looking for easy targets. Now, I'm sure I would presume that Adam had told his wife, God already told us, don't go near those two trees. The rest, we can do whatever we like. Enjoy I presume he did that. But then she went right by there. So what do we learn from this? If we know something can make us fall into sin, let's stay far from it. I give you an example. I have a very sweet tooth. I love sweet drinks. I could drink Coke by the ton, tons of it, but I never buy Coke. I don't buy sweet drinks. Why? I know if it's in the fridge, I'll just say, ah, no harm done. You know? I'm pre-diabetic. But I'll say, ah, one Coke won't kill you. And the devil will probably make me diabetic with that and fall into sin. So, next question we ask ourselves is, hmm, why didn't Adam stop her? I mean, he was right there. God already told him. He told his wife, why didn't he warn her? Don't listen to this serpent. God already told us not to. I already told you. Why did he not warn her? You see, another common problem is that men who are made by God, not by ourselves, to be head of our homes, have failed in our duties. Many men fail in their duties of headship. Head is to protect, is to guide. And you know, today, most men are like, you know, men and women get married and there's no head in the family. Headless family, like headless chickens, right? So problem number two, if you are a headless, you are a failed husband, wake up. 
it's easy just to sit back and act blur, which is a lot of what we like to do. So when they ate of the fruit, all of a sudden they realized that the Bible says their eyes were open. You mean all the time they were walking with closed eyes? No, obviously not. It means the eyes of their conscience were open. And now they felt guilty. And when you feel guilty, you tend to want to hide. When you see a guilty person, he usually doesn't want to see, look you in the eye. He dips his head down. And even when you talk to him, he sort of covers his mouth and tries to hide his, some part of him. All right? Okay, so we realize the moment our conscience is aware we've sinned, we, real, we want to cover ourselves. Now, no animal covers himself. Animals, chimpanzees, they look like hairy men sometimes, but they're perfectly happy being naked. <clears throat> Even babies before the age of conscience, awareness, are perfectly happy to be naked, but not after that. So when we, our conscience is awake, we want to cover ourselves. So what did Eve do? They quickly look for the biggest leaf around, and that was the fig leaf. It's big and round. And they somehow stuck it together or stitched it together and covered themselves, probably a loincloth, right, to cover themselves. Now, of course, a fig leaf cannot cover you very well. Try it today if you want to just go out wear a fig leaf dress. It's sort of like, you know, not like cloth, it wraps around you nicely, or animal skins wrap around you nicely. A, claw, uh, a leaf is crinkly and there are gaps everywhere, and you're going to be very embarrassed walking around. You know, your parts of your body will definitely not be covered. So when they did that, they tried to cover themselves as best they could with what they could get. Now today, when men stand before God, they always try to use some kind of fig leaf. We often use religion, you know, a, a bad man going to God, his God, will take joysticks and, you know, hopefully that, uh, God, uh, you, you know I'm a bad guy, but uh, I'm a religious guy, okay? Uh, look at my joysticks, huh? okay? I'll look at my head, I'm bowed down and my hands are like that, okay? So what happens is we use camel, we use coverings, hoping it will cover our obvious sinfulness, even the idol God knowing you're not a good boy, all right? But with the joysticks, you can try to cover. So we all try to put coverings. And then the amazing part is, God comes into the garden and calls for Adam, where are you? You know, just earlier than this, two chapters ago, we saw the Creator God, so awesome so high, so amazing. And now this awesome God who can create like that comes down and says, Adam, where are you? You know, the average mind, the human mind cannot grasp this. Either the God is very high, way up there, or the God's a tiny God in the kitchen, <clears throat> on the table. They cannot have a God that's very high and yet very personal that wants to fellowship with us. Only our God can do that. So high and yet so personal, so gracious. Wants to fellowship with me, especially after Adam's sin. So this is a picture of God visiting us. God reaching to us, not us reaching to God. Adam didn't look for God, he ran from God, but God looked for him. Now that's why I'm always so thankful for the Trinity, the Trinity. If God was just a monotheistic God, he has to be up there or he's down here, right? Trinity, God the Father in heaven, God the Son went on the cross, God the Holy Spirit lives in me. Wow, what a blessed thing to have a God to have and worship, the holy triune God. Now some people say, how can God be one and God be three? Well, that's the stupidest question I have ever heard. God can be anything. If God wants to be a one million in one, what's your problem? <laughs> some people say, how can, if God was not created, then how can? If God cannot create himself, don't call him God, call him something else, right? 
So when we call him God, he can do things we cannot picture. So when you say, how can God be three in one? Are you stupid or something? <clears throat> With God, why is that so impossible? With you, of course, it's impossible. All right, so we see here some important truths we hope will help us. <clears throat> Let's continue to see the results of sin. When God asked Adam, did you eat of the fruit? He immediately said, the woman whom you gave me, she gave me the fruit. And then God asked the woman, she said, the serpent gave me the fruit. So we see here, one of the major impacts of sin is broken relationships. What is, has happened here was, everybody doesn't trust everybody, everybody blames everybody else, and so we see a huge impact on society because of this. When people ask me to describe Christianity, the blessings of Christianity in one word, I usually say relationships. Through Christ, we have a restored relationship with our Creator, we have a restored relationship with others. But in this case, the relationships were broken. You see a lot of problems because of this. Another victim, the serpent. God said, because you've done this, you will now slither on your belly and your mouth will eat dust. Up to this point, the serpent was really a reptile with short legs, much like a crocodile. <clears throat> but the legs were then taken away and from then on, it moved on its belly. Now, if you think this story is kind of strange, like a fairy tale, you just need to look at an anatomy of snakes. Just type in legs in snakes and you will see that there are tiny little legs for example in a python tiny little embryonic legs even including with little digits like its toes or fingers in fact a python uses these digits to hold the mate during mating time so evolutionists will spend a lot of effort trying to prove how a snake a reptile lost its legs over millions of years. We don't need to. It's found in Genesis chapter 3. But interestingly enough, a little hint of the gospel is seen in the curse of the snake. The snake was told of the enmity between the woman and you. The seed of the woman, your seed, this is what's going to happen. One will crush your head, and then the seed of the snake will crush the heel. Now, of course, when the writer wrote this, it didn't make any sense at all. What is this? But when we know the gospel, it makes sense. So, beautiful drama, the hint of the plot is coming out now. Later, we know at the cross, Satan hurt Christ. But when Christ said, it is finished, Satan was totally, all his dreams and all his future was totally crushed. Satan finished, right? So the head of Satan was crushed. The heel of Christ was crushed. Heel meaning hurt but not mortal wound. All right. So we see also the enmity between women and crawling things. Example, my wife cannot stand anything that is uh, a crawling thing. A lizard in the house must be got rid of. To me, the lizard's a wonderful insect catcher. Totally uh, given by God to catch insects. <clears throat> Another victim, the woman. The woman said, God said to the woman, your sorrow will multiply in your conception. If you ever understood labor pain and you won't if you're a male but if you're a woman you understand it. it's the greatest agony of all nothing is more painful i used to work in a maternity hospital 
It was a hundred babies a night and one of the agonies was listening to them yell and scream. <clears throat> no other animal goes through labor pains, they just deliver. Chickens drop eggs, pigs deliver piglets in a dozen at a time, no problem. Sorrow shall that conception be. A baby comes out crying, no other animal comes out crying. Goes on to say to the woman, your desire shall be to your husband. Women want a husband, even though they know they will be bullied greatly. In many cultures, women are treated so badly. They're treated like property of a man who can bully, do anything they want, and yet still women want to get married. Desire. Someone once asked me, how do you know a woman wants to get married? I said, blood test, very easy. To get a clean needle, prick heart, if blood comes out, she wants to get married. What does that mean? Every woman wants to get married. Am I being a sexist? No, it's in the Bible. And it says, they want to get married even though the man will rule over her. Look at these verses. Look at them carefully when you go back, when you, when you open your Bible. And then... So woman's sorrow will be in the family, in the home, from the birth onward, all right, to the marriage and all the agonies. Man was then, Adam was then cursed. The ground, cursed is the ground. It will bring forth thorns and thistles, weeds. Oh, agriculture is agony. You work so hard to plant something, but something keeps competing with it, and those are weeds. Don't be a farmer if you have a choice sell herbicide. <clears throat> then goes on to say, in sorrow you will eat your bread. Wow! You say, is that true? I mean, some people have great jobs. Imagine if I'm the president of the country. And that's even stress. In the sweat of thy brow you will eat your bread. Pressure. President of the biggest company. Pressure different pressures, competitors. There is no job on earth without pressure. Sweat of your brow. Animals, how do they eat? Fish, open their mouth. Birds fly around, pick up seed. Don't need to work hard. Sow, water, harvest, Prepare the food, store it properly, uh, none of that. Just eat, eat, eat. <clears throat> this is the curse that man, that, that, that results because of sin. <clears throat> we now continue to see the impact of sin. God tells Adam, you, after all your labor of stress and the sweat of your brow, you will eat your bread and then you will go back to the dust. In other words, you will not live forever. Now this is wisdom from God. If man is wicked and he is allowed to go on living, just imagine a Hitler about to go on and on living. His amount of Wickedness, power, and control will be unbearable. So Adam goes back to the dust, and Adam's name actually means dust. So it's a reminder, okay? Just a Hebrew word for dust. Then Eve is given, the lady is given a name, her name is Eve. Eve simply means mother of the living. Now we see so much bad news. Thankfully, there's good news in verse 21. God then provides for Adam and Eve skins for their covering. They had used fig leaves until now, you know, like uh, very embarrassed covering themselves. God then provides skins for them. Now, of course, the question is, where the skin come from? It's got to, got to come from an animal. You have to kill an animal 
then rip off its skin and give it to Adam and Eve. In other words, an innocent animal had to be killed because of Adam's sin. Isn't this the gospel in seed form? One day the Lamb of God would die for our sins. Wow! You see how this beautiful drama is unfolding. First we saw the crushing of the head of the serpent, the crushing of the heel of the seed of the woman. Now we see a little bit more of the gospel. So it's all bad news until this point that God now gives them a covering. And then God expels them from the Garden of Eden. Never to come back to this garden. <clears throat> After this, we will see the downward spiral very quickly. You know, we've spent a lot of time on the first three chapters of the Bible. Huge amount of time because I believe a lot of seed truths are here. A lot of seed truths for understanding the rest of the Bible and also how to build your Christian life. It's foundation laying. Foundation takes a long time in building most things. But once a foundation is there, the subsequent flaws can be built much faster. So I would suggest the first three chapters you read and know well. The next lesson, we're going to go through many chapters, like eight chapters in one sweep. And after that, we start going through 30, 40 chapters in one sweep. So, please lay a good foundation for the rest of the beautiful book. Summary of it all for our life. What is the summary of our life? Birth is painful. Life is hard. Death is certain. We come in crying. We labor in the sweat of our brow. And our future, bleak, frightening. The redemption story hopefully will change this very terrible life that man will have on earth. Sorrow on earth is normal. So sad. The history of man is a history basically of sorrow. And so, thankfully, there is a redemption story.